Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'll take it. I heard that. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. But also know that we still have our strict rules in effect. So please, social distance, please. Wear your mask and please remember to social distance as you leave. Good. Are there any announcements? Yes, ma'am. I would just like to say thank you for all the people that have sent me cards and stuff while I've been having procedures done and going back and forth to the doctor. And um, I would ask, like to ask for your continued prayers. I'm having some pre major surgery tomorrow um, in Lexington. And um, so if you would just please keep me in your prayers. It is a, a great comfort to me and Mallory to know that we have you all as a church family to support us. And um, hopefully I'll see you next Sunday. But if not, you know, I'll see you the next. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Any others? Amen. Amen. Any others? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that's fine. We'll have them again, but that's fine. You can if you want. Okay, announcements. If there be any more announcements, we'll hear some more pretty music.
Oh, I also want to thank you all for uh, filling out your surveys and getting them, <coughs> pardon me, getting them back to us. We appreciate your input. Uh, we wanted to be able to make an informed decision when decision time comes. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Along those lines, uh, you know that the United Methodist Church is facing a possible split between the conservatives and the United Methodist Church. There has The new denomination has been named. The uh, conservative denomination will be called the Global Methodist Church. So please remember our denomination in your prayers as we face the inevitable. So please pray for our church. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests at this moment, at this time? Continue to remember me. I'm going through some tests, so remember me. Any others? JJ Thunderbird. JJ Thunderbird. JJ Thunderbird. Okay. And please speak up. I'm not as young as I used to be. My wife says I have selective hearing. Also remember Floyd Scott. I had a mini stroke. So remember him. Any others? Or I'm sorry, you done? No, I got some friends. Okay. Notice that all the Carolina fans have made a point to wave at me this morning. <coughs> Any others? I want to remember my cousin Dwight. Yes. Our cousin Dwight takes whenever we go to the beach for vacation. We visit him a lot, so please pray for him. Any others? And a praise to be in our church today. Yes. Praise that we're in his church. Yes. In his house. Any others? I want to get every, give everyone the opportunity. If there be no others, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you, first of all, for being able to gather in your house. What a blessing. But Lord, keep us mindful that we must continue to do the right things to keep us safe and healthy. And Lord, we also thank you for your love. That unmerited love, that, that grace that is extended to all. We thank you that through that grace, you promise to hear us. But not only to hear us, but to answer us. You promise to be with us even until the end of time. 
So, Father, even in the midst of a pandemic, we know you're with us. In the midst of trials and tribulations, we know you're with us. In the midst of surgery and, and medical testing, we know you're with us. In the midst of healing, we know you're the reason for that healing because you are there. We thank you for being that kind of God. A father that loves his children, loves us so much that he sent his only son for us to the cross. Thank you for that cross. Thank you for the love that sent Jesus to the cross. Now, Father, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of our sickness, in the midst of our depression, in, in the midst of whatever sickness, whatever we may be going through, let us look to that cross and let us call on You because we know You're there. Now, Father, we leave these petitions, whether spoken or unspoken, in Your hands and we claim them done in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh. 
beautiful, beautiful music. I thank God for these two up here. Thank the Lord for them, don't y'all? Yes. Amen. Amen. But I also thank God for the cross. And the message this morning is we stand because of the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. And I'll give you a minute or two to find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. And I will be reading from the New King James Version. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, and the New King James Version reads in this manner. <clears throat> For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request the sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. The Word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. I remember as a little boy, my grandfather was a Baptist preacher. And there would be some weekends that I would travel with him down to his church, New Hope Baptist Church, down in Bolton, North Carolina. Does anyone know where that is? Eastern part of the state. And I remember hearing him preach many messages. But my, my favorite messages that he would preach, and my favorite messages still to this day, are the messages of the cross. I remember how he would Tell us how, how, just how much God loved us. That He loved us so much that He sent His only Son to die the death of the cross. How He was beaten and how He had to carry His own cross and how He was nailed to it. And how He said those final words. It is finished. And my grandfather's name was Reverend Clarence Locklear, or as I called him, Papa. Now on those occasions, it was not Papa's reasoning powers or any eloquence on his part that touched me so deeply. Nor was it due to my own ability to, to rationalize and understand. Oh, and on a side note... Uh, Last year, maybe a year before, one of my cousins out in Oklahoma said she found something. It was a binder, smaller than this one, a small black binder, filled with my grandfather's sermons. And she said, I have no use for it. Would you like to have it? What do you think my answer was? Yes. <laughs> yes, and I have them in the parsonage office. I told her one day I'll preach one. But the, it wasn't any of this that caused me to be moved so deeply, but it was the power of love 
that this old but always new story releases whenever it's told. This love has touched and changed my life. You all have heard the story of how I was before Jesus. Now you see how I am after Jesus. I tell folks I weren't always a pastor. Had a wild side. But that love changed my life and it has changed so many other lives. Has it changed yours? This is the interactive part again. Has it changed your life? The heart of our Christian faith is Christ and Christ crucified. And when that simple yet profound message is proclaimed and when it is taught, it releases a power that changes the lives of all those that hear. And this power changes people's lives in ways that the most learned and scholarly psychologists and philosophers can only dream about. In our lesson this morning, Paul's speaking about wisdom. True wisdom. And true wisdom is how God thinks and how God acts in this world through Jesus. For many people in the world who are unconverted, the message of the cross sounds like foolishness. I remember when my wife and I were dating, she gave her life to the Lord and she came and told me, first words out of my mouth was, don't you push your Jesus on me. She'll tell you it's the truth. I said, don't you push your Jesus on me. Let me come to Him. Needless did I know that Jesus came to me. A little church in Red Springs, North Carolina. Who knows where that is? <laughs> and I gave my heart to Him and He changed my life. But true wisdom is how God thinks and how He acts in the world. And many people remain unconverted and it does sound like foolishness to them as it did to me. As me and Mama would be sitting in the house, some of our church friends would come to the front door and Joel would run out the back door. How many did that? Was I the only one? Okay. I was running. I didn't want to hear anything about anybody's Jesus. It sounded like foolishness. I didn't want to hear it. But to those of us who are now saved by the cross, to those of us who have heard and experienced the message of the cross. It is the power of God. Just look at what happens to the lives of people when the message is preached and taught. Murderers become martyrs. Fighters become lovers. Hate mongers become peacemakers. Drunkards become evangelists. Gang members become church members. And the list could go on and on and on. An alcoholic and drug user becomes a pastor. The very power of God is let loose to those of us who are being saved by the message of the cross. And as Christians, folks were bound together by the message of the cross. And here, and now, we stand in a different place because of the cross. Now Jesus uses the analogy of the ammo, ammo, camel and the eye of a needle. How many know that story? Jesus says it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, this upsets some folks, including his disciples that said, well, well, then who can be saved? Listen to how Jesus responds to them. With man, this is impossible. But with God, 
all things are possible. Our hope never rests in our own efforts. But on the unimaginably foolish love of God. Now I call it foolish because that's the way the world sees it. But it's only foolishness when it is seen from the perspective of the world. If we ask the world for the answers to our questions, then we are doomed with the world's answers. But when we come to God for the answers to our questions, we obtain ultimate wisdom. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, after His baptism, He immediately went into the desert. And right now we're supposed to be in the desert, right? In the desert of Lent. And in the desert, He was tempted. And the basic temptations He faced was power, prestige, and possessions. He wrestled with these for, for 40 days until Satan left. But Satan said, I'll be back at, a, at, a, at the right time, at an opportune time. And here in our desert, it's here where we reach the fullness of what the world considers the gospel foolishness. In our society, Prestige, power, and possessions are the basic promises that are advertised all around us as the reward of living by society standards. But folks, these things are foolishness to God. They're foolishness to, to those of us who have been changed and called by the power of God and by the message of the cross. There's no escaping the seriousness of Christianity. Either it's a stumbling block to people in our society, or the values of modern society are foolishness. To the serious Christian. We can't have it both ways. Dr. Luke Timothy Johnson. Well that's a biblical name isn't it? Luke Timothy. For our present age. In which the wisdom of the world. Is expressed in individualism. Narcissism. A preoccupation with private rights. And competition. The wisdom of the cross is the most profoundly countercultural message of them all. It takes courage to trust in the message of the cross. Because this means that we are going to be radically different from the world around us. We're going to be different from our neighbors. We're going to be different than those we come into contact with. Radically different. But I want you to realize something this morning, that the crucifixion, crucifixion of Jesus began long before He was born on earth. With a decision in the heart, God decided to journey from glory to poverty. From power to vulnerability. From awesomeness to nothing. The God of the universe made a conscious decision to be born as a baby. A human baby in a trough. In that manger in a finite world. And as we marvel at this miracle of miracles, and as Paul was marveling at this miracle of miracles, he wrote to the Philippians in chapter 2, Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made, of himself, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, 
being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. This was the first step to the cross. It's what theologians call the self, self emptying of God. The message of the cross begins with God's willing and loving release of privilege and power. Some of the, the basic principles and values that our modern society place a high price tag on. Many do not understand the, the wisdom of God at work in this world through Christ Jesus. And what I'm about to say sounds very familiar for our day. In Jesus' day, the, the political powers were threatened by it. They held on to a different kind of wisdom. A worldly wisdom about what was true and right. It was built on power and control. Does that sound familiar? Is not our society built on power and control? It's still the mindset of the world today. And the world through its wisdom cannot understand the wisdom based on love and grace. It's foolishness. It sounds weak. How foolish and weak does it seem to turn the other cheek in the face of an adversary's threat? How foolish and weak does it sound to love your enemies? What kind of craziness is it to forgive someone 70 times 7 times? What kind of foolishness is it to love your neighbor like you love yourself? How silly it seems to be the servant rather than the one being served. This is how the world sees it and this is how they say and feel that it's foolishness. Somebody hits me, I'm hitting them back. <clears throat> me be a servant? Watch somebody else's? Uh-uh. Love my enemies? You don't know what they did to me. It's like foolishness to them. And why is it foolishness? Because it's not the way of the world. But folks, it is the way of Jesus Christ. When Jesus took our sins and nailed them on the cross, He took it upon Himself to let go of His privilege, His power, and His prestige in order to be identified with us. With us. With human beings. As miserable as we are. As undeserving as we are. He wanted to identify with us. And identify is a very scary word. Identification means more than just caring or feeling for people. Identification is becoming one with people. It's risking our identity by sharing the identity of another. When the Nazis invaded Denmark in the Second World War, notices quickly went out in Copenhagen. And these notices ordered all the Jews to sew big yellow stars of David on their clothing so that everybody could see that they were Jews. Or as the Nazis thought, a former or a lower form of life. But there was a Christian that lived in Copenhagen who had a habit of riding in the parks every day. 
And the day after this notice went out, he still went on his ride. But there was one thing different on his jacket. For everyone to see was a large yellow star of David. In Bethlehem of Judea, some 2,000 years ago, the God and King of the universe put on the badge of our humanity and cried out from a little manger, fellow human beings. He became one of us. He identified with us. And that great moment in history God was passionately identifying Himself with us. We need to ask God to enable us to try and get into the shoes of those who have nothing. And folks, if we do this, we will be less obsessed about wanting everything. If we're struggling with what the message of the cross will require of us, let's remember that the closer we get to those who are hurting, and the closer we get to those who are suffering, and the closer we get to those who are being broken by this world, the less difficult it will be for us. When we begin to identify with the pain of other people, it changes what is important to us. Have you noticed that from the very start of Jesus' ministry, right up to the cross, Jesus turned the value of society upside down. Or let me change that. He turned the value of society right side up. Because He became one with the least and the lowest of the world. He always saw things through different eyes. In order for us to get our values right, the wisdom of the world must be replaced by the powerful, life-saving message of the cross and let the church say Amen
music. Y'all gonna have to pick longer songs. We enjoy your singing and playing. Beautiful, beautiful. Again, thank you for joining us this morning and those that are with us on Facebook. We continue to broadcast on Facebook. If you don't have a church home, you're welcome here with us. Let us now receive the benediction. May the God of grace and glory go with you as you follow this Lenten path. Wherever it takes you and to whomever it takes you, may you go with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. Amen.
I was getting ready to try to blow them out with this mask on. <laughs> that wouldn't work. I got him. to worry about. At least I'm hoping. Well, I know Ruth gets your heart rate up. Yeah, she does. Yeah, you know. Even when she's not around. Uh -huh. <laughs> God bless y'all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week. Just leave that there.